Hi, I'm Kyle. I've been watching these booktube videos for a while now, and I thought that it would be a cool thing for me to do too, to just talk a little bit about some of the books I've been reading. Um, so that's what I'm going to do today. I, I figured I'd just have a, a little short informal chat about a few of the things I've been reading recently, not get into a ton of like in-depth analysis or really even like I'm not going to give full reviews of any of these things. Just a, a, a little discussion of my first impressions, basically. Maybe if I enjoy making this video, I might make longer format reviews in the future of some of them or something. I don't know. I haven't, haven't really thought that through all the way yet. I just thought this would be a fun thing to do. So the first thing I want to talk about is Lightning Rods by Helen DeWitt. I listened to that on Audible, a, a really good audiobook uh, narrated by Dushko Petrovich, I believe his name was. So Lightning Rods came out, I think it was published in 2011. If it's not, when I'm editing this later, I'll go in and put in when it was really published. I heard about this book from the Backlisted podcast, and I'd, I'd never read anything by Helen DeWitt before. Helen DeWitt is apparently well known for um, The Last Samurai, which has nothing... I, I assume that book was related to the movie with Tom Cruise, but apparently it's not. Apparently it's a good book. Um, but I, I was unfamiliar with it. I, it's on my uh, TBR at this point. It sounds really good. So Lightning Rods follows this salesman named Joe who's kind of like down on his luck. He's living in a trailer at this point. He goes through a couple of different sales jobs in the beginning of the book, and he's not very successful. He doesn't, doesn't have much luck in either of them. Doesn't really sell. Uh, he, I think he sells one vacuum cleaner and maybe like one set of encyclopedias. He, he has this recurring sexual fantasy that, that has different variations on it, but basically uh, a woman gets stuck in a hole somehow where the top half of her body is on one side of a wall and the bottom half of her body is on another side of the wall. So for example, one of the scenarios he comes up with is like the woman is leaning out of her window to say something to her gardener and somehow the window falls down and she gets stuck like this. And then the husband comes in. Meanwhile, on the other side of the wall, this is very important, Joe emphasizes for his fantasy, the woman has to continue carrying on this conversation with the gardener as if nothing is happening. Anyway, the book is, it's really fucking funny. And it's, it's like a great satire on just the American, like, corporate office environment in general. Like, it's so hilarious. I was, I was laughing out loud so many times reading this. And it's also like a really poignant critique, right, of like, of the of how women are treated in the workplace first of all and also there's some really like funny stuff about kind of like the irrationality of of some kinds of american politics the way the way that like a lot of leftist politics have sort of been co-opted by like corporate cultures well i don't want to give away plot details it's very funny it's a good book I highly recommend it. Oh, and also, like, just a comment on the audiobook, too. So Dushko Petrovich's narration is, like, hilarious. He he has this, like, super deadpan way of, um, uh, his, this super deadpan tone that just perfectly captures the book. And especially, like, it's, it's really funny because for the, mo like, he has this really ludicrous idea, right? Like, he wants to introduce this product into corporate environments that's basically like like having prostitutes in the office that that's his his idea and he brings this up like 99% of the time first of all he talks about it in this super like deadpan way and in almost every instance people don't object to it and they don't seem to think like wow this is a ridiculous idea like for the most part other people go along with this idea, which is pretty, pretty fucked up. And then, and it makes it even funnier, like, the few times that some characters are like, you're doing what? Like, that's fucking insane. That's gotta be illegal. Um, yeah, highly recommend that book. I had one other thought about lightning rods that I forgot to mention yesterday, which is that it's not only about, like, the role of women in the workplace, but it's also about how, like, everyone is ethically compromised under this economic system, how how difficult it is to do something that's personally meaningful and and valuable under capitalism. 
there's that saying, you know, that there's no ethical consumption under capitalism. Well, Lightning Rods is about how there isn't any ethical production under capitalism either. Joe, for example, he really wanted to sell encyclopedias, and he had he had good intentions behind that. Like he he thought that selling encyclopedias would be a benefit to to people. Like it would it would make them smarter. It would maybe encourage people to like go to college or something. Encourage people to learn to learn more. But nobody bought encyclopedias from him. And so he ends up having to, like, he, he ends up doing the lightning rod thing, right? Like, that that's his third choice. It's not the thing that he really wanted to do. Um, and even, like, the lightning rods themselves, some of them have, like, have really high aspirations. One of them wants to be a lawyer. Um, one of them ends up being a, a Supreme Court justice after she, she wants to be, like, a civil rights attorney. But even even for those women to, like, in order for them to attain those kinds of good positions and, and positions that enable them to benefit other people in the world and, like, do good in the world, in order to do that under this system, they have to, like, literally and metaphorically get fucked. Like, that's that's what happens. So the next book that I finished uh, last weekend, I think, is V by Thomas Pynchon. Pynchon? Pynchon, I think. Um... So I got into Pinchon uh, earlier this year. I read, oh God, this is a big one. I read Against the Day, um, which I was actually given as a Christmas present in 2006 when I was 16 years old <laughs> by um, a friend of my family. And it had sat on my bookshelf up until uh, this last year. Against the Day is fucking brilliant. Like the, the best book I've read this year. So I picked up V as my next spot because as the next book to read from Pinchon, I, I knew I wanted to read everything that Pinchon wrote after that. And I figured I'd just start at the beginning. I know I've read a lot of uh, like conflicting opinions online. People, people generally like, I think that V is not considered one of his strongest works. I think that people don't uh, usually recommend it as like a starting point for him. And I can see why. Like it's so in a lot of the ways there are moments in this book that really like capture the same kind of brilliance that I saw in Against the Day. Especially there's a a chapter in South Africa during the Bondel Swartz Rebellion, I believe, is the the historical event that was going on. Um where all of these Europeans who happened to be in South Africa at the time isolate themselves in this compound that's surrounded by a moat. And it's it's just this, like, swirling, hallucinogenic, like, nightmarish, like, over-the-top, like, de sexual depravity and, like, violence. And there's also, like, flashbacks during this chapter to the Herero genocide in which... Oh god, I should have like written this down, but it, it's it's like a a huge number of of people were were murdered in South Africa at this time. Um like I think it was like 500,000 maybe. I'm pulling that number out of my ass. I don't I should have looked it up before I started filming this. Anyway, it's an event that I had I had never heard about before. So first of all, like the writing is fucking brilliant. It's it's like I said, it's like it's like a nightmare carnival ride that you're on and like his language is just so beautiful. He's he's probably the best prose stylist I've ever read. And I I think the thing that I really like about Pinchon is that he brings to light these events like like the Bondal Sports Rebellion, like the Herrero genocide. Like he talks about um, the end of this book takes place during this event in Malta where basically like the English had colonized Malta and there was a skirmish with some Maltese people who didn't want the English there and some English officers fired on them and uh, some people were killed. Anyway, what, what I'm trying to get at here is that one of the things that I really like about Pinchon is that he, he writes about these historical events that are kind of like unknown. So to me, I'm, I'm an American. I was born in America in New England in the late 80s, and I had never heard of the Herrero genocide, which has killed like hundreds of thousands of people were killed in this event. 
And it was also, so it's, it's the Germans who had done this. And it, this is in like the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. Anyway, I read the Wikipedia page on it after. I'd love to read like an actual book on it if anyone has any recommendations. But it, it's considered like a, like a precursor to World War I, World War I, basically. And also eventually to like the Holocaust. The Herero genocide happens in the, the end of the 19th century, early 20th century. I'm pretty sure it's end of 19th century. And the German state then has to build up this bureaucracy to like legalize and authorize this genocide, right? And not only to like make it legal, but like how do you get troops to do these kinds of like commit these kinds of atrocities? And how do you manage like the slaughter of that many people? Like there, there's there's like, there's bureaucracy around this kind of thing, right? And like that gets built up in this period. And then like that that kind of bureaucracy and also that precedence is in place already when World War II comes around. Anyway, my point is that Pinchon like brings to light these historical events that I had never even heard of and that are these like atrocities. And he gives them these like, like a world historical significance. Like these events that I've I've never heard of are are crucially important, and they're also tied in to like modernity at large. Modernity is built and founded upon these events, and there there isn't really like a way out of there. And one of the other things that I get out of V is that like I I feel like a large part of V is kind of saying that like there there isn't any way to make sense of this. Like these things are connected. There's so much stuff that's connected in, in, in the modern world, basically. Like every, all of modern history, everything that came before it led up to this point. And there's no way to make sense of things. There's too much data. You can't comprehend it. So anyway, I liked that a lot about V. Thematically, I think it's brilliant. Even like the language in parts is, it, throughout the whole thing, the language is brilliant. The big thing that I dislike about V, I would not recommend V as a starting pl place for people. Um, I honestly, like Against the Day, huge fucking book, right? I would recommend this as a place to start, though, if you're not intimidated by the length. I think it's a very readable book, and I think it uh, touches on a lot of similar themes to V, except I think that Against the Day is a lot more optimistic than V is. Against the Day kind of, like, leaves room for, like, there is goodness in the world still. V, I don't know if it does. What I dislike about V is that there's a few there's a few chapters in here that get very very convoluted and that I think I probably lost the plot for a little bit like literally and metaphorically like I, I had no idea what was going on in uh the first chapter that stencil appears for example is really confusing um like perspective is jumping around and there's a ton of characters as always in Pinchon um and it, it's just really difficult to follow. And same with, there's a letter, one chapter is a letter from this guy named Fausto. That chapter is pretty hard to follow too for, for similar reasons. Yeah, that's V. It's, it's a really good book. It's a pretty hard book. It's absolutely a brilliant book. So the next book that I started listening to on Audible after Lightning Rods, um, is Mansfield Park by Jane Austen. Um, I I wouldn't say I'm new to Austen, so I read Sense and Sensibility probably five years ago, and I loved it. And I never read anything else again by her just because I... Actually, I haven't read a ton in the last five years in general. Like, I, I've been distracted by other things. And anyway, so Jane Austen fell off my radar. This year I've been able to read a ton again, um, so one of the things I reread this year was Sense and Sensibility, which I, I confirmed that I fucking love it. So after I read Sense and Sensibility, I read Pride and Prejudice, which was also great. And at that point, I'm like, okay, I should just continue reading her books in order. So Mansfield Park is the next one. I picked that up. Um, so I started listening to this and I got about six chapters into it. And I was like, I have no idea what the fuck is going on. Who are the Crawfords? Who is Mr. or Dr. Grant? Like, am I listening to a Trollop novel? I, I thought I knew Dr. Grant from The Warden. I don't remember him being introduced in this book at all. Um, so anyway, I, I had, I like, I found it difficult to get into this book. Um, 
which was surprising because I listened to both Sense and Sensibility and Pride and Prejudice earlier this year, and I both found them like super easy to listen to. I restarted Mansfield Park after that, and I like when I listened to it the second time through, the first couple chapters, I just sort of like listened to them and I didn't do anything. Usually when I listen to audiobooks, I'm like cooking dinner or I'm like doing chores around the house or I'm walking the dog in the park or something like that. Um, but the first couple uh, chapters of this, I, I think you really need to like pay attention to because the first page especially is super dense. Like a, a ton of characters are introduced in this first page and they're all pretty crucial. And it's also like every time Jane Austen introduces a character, like it's it's pretty important. You need if you miss any of those sentences, you're you're missing out a lot on like on understanding this character. Anyway, it's setting up a ton of stuff in these first couple pages. Uh, you have to pay really close attention to it. But when I went back and did that, like I'm, I do like it. I, I was gonna say I, I like I loved it, and I actually did. I do kind of really like the first few chapters. Where I'm at now, um, like so, the Crawfords have moved in to the the Grants have taken over the parsonage there. Uh, the Crawfords have moved in, and they're like doing their little play now. They're getting ready for that. It's so in, in some ways there's like the same kind of like Austin Wit that you have in, in Sense and Sensibility and Pride and Prejudice, but it also kind of feels like in in Pride and Prejudice and in Sense and Sensibility, the narration gets focalized through these characters like Lizzie Bennet or Eleanor Dashwood, who are in some ways like they're kind of outside of these social systems that they're critiquing. Like they recognize the the absurdity of of like, like Lizzie especially, for example, recognizes the absurdity of her of her younger sister's actions, um, and like Eleanor recognizes the absurdity of of some of Marianne's like things too. Although I think I think in Sense and Sensibility it's a little more complicated. Like Marianne um, may have more sense than than uh, Eleanor in some cases. Anyway, my point is that like you have these characters in in Sense and Sensibility and Pride and Prejudice that the narration is being focalized through that are intelligent and that are astute and that are making like good observation. They're, they're 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 criticizing some of the the negative things. There's the negative behaviors and the negative like just the negative things that are happening around them, the, the the negative values of society, kind of. And you don't really get that in this book. Like, it's, you get the, the Crawfords and Tom Bertram and and the Bertram daughters. They're, they're all these, like, silly kind of, um, you know, flighty, trite... Flighty is not a good word. They're, the, the Bertram sisters are, like... They're all kind of silly and superficial. That's the word I was looking for. Silly, they're superficial. They're, in some cases, like, uh, Henry Crawford is very, like, duplicitous. They're they're not very good people. But there isn't, like, there isn't, like, real criticism of them yet. I know a lot of people dislike this book because Fanny is not, uh, she's a very, like, weak heroine, which I totally can see. Um, and I think that that's part of what I'm disliking about it, too, is that, like, Fanny is not sort of, like, criticizing these people in a way that's that's useful or, like, shedding light on, on society in a way that's useful. I still like it, though. Like, Austin's writing is brilliant. I do, I feel like the other thing that I dislike, I, I just said I like it, but I'm going to bring up one more thing I dislike, is that the characters feel a lot more flat. I think that Austin Austin is a genius at writing characters, especially like Pride and Prejudice and Sense and Sensibility. All of those characters, a, a lot of the time, characters start out in her novels, especially in Sense and Sensibility, I felt. But I think even in Pride and Prejudice a little bit, these characters start out feeling really like flat and like caricatures, kind of. I'm not going to be able to remember her name. But the character in Sense and Sensibility, for example, who they go... 
uh, Marianne and Eleanor go and spend like the summer in London with this woman and she, at first she seems like this really like superficial trite gossipy woman um who like they don't want to hang around her but after after Marianne like after stuff happens in the book I don't want to give plot spoilers she she turns out to be a really really nice person and she's like one of the one of the kindest characters in the book and anyway, my point is that a lot of a lot of Austin's characters I find are like that, especially her minor characters. Like they'll they'll seem at first like they're kind of flat, and then eventually they end up having a lot of depth to them. And and her characters really seem like real people. And I guess I'm I'm only a third of the way into this book, so I guess that's what I'm seeing right now. Is I'm hoping that's what I'm seeing right now at least is that like. My first impressions of these characters are that they're all kind of like flat. They don't have a ton of depth to them, but maybe as we go on, that will emerge. So the other book I'm reading right now is The Passenger by Cormac McCarthy, which I think a ton of people are reading right now. Actually, a ton of people have probably finished it. I picked it up a little late. Um, I got it. I pre-ordered it, so I got it on release day. Um, but I didn't start reading it until, I don't know, like a, a week and a half later because I was finishing up V. I'm not a huge Cormac McCarthy fan. I've only ever read, I've read The Road. That's the only other Cormac McCarthy book I've read. I've actually avoided Cormac McCarthy forever until this year when I read The Road. I read it over the summer. Um, I've avoided Cormac McCarthy because my impression of him was that, you know, there's like a certain type of person, I feel like, who gets really into Cormac McCarthy, and I felt like I didn't want to be that person. <laughs> but anyway, I, I really liked The Road, so I thought The Road was was brilliant. It was a lot, so this is the other thing, is that I, I felt like my impression of Cormac McCarthy was that it was going to be like super dark and grim, and I actually found The Road, I, I thought The Road was a very optimistic book, and I thought it was really hopeful, and I thought that it, it really, like, I thought it was a really good humanist novel. And that surprised me, because I did not think that Cormac McCarthy was a humanist. After I loved The Road so much, I pre-ordered this book. I got it a couple weeks ago when it came out. I've started it. I'm about 120 pages in or something. I, I think I just finished chapter four. I, I am definitely not liking it as much as The Road. I'm also kind of, like, disappointed in the writing. Like, some of the writing just sounds bad to me. There was a page... Let's see. I wrote it down. One thing I should know, I hate when books have these, like, like, these kinds of pages, you know? You can't, like, flip through them. Why Why do they do that? It's terrible. Oh, so here's a, here's a sentence that I read this morning when I was reading it, and I was like, this is just not... A, this is a bad sentence. Like, if I was editing this, I would be like, you need to take that out. It, is, it sounds terrible. The slight warp of it, made of her perfect face, a pre-Raphaelite portrait, long and gently skewed. Like, that, the, the assonance of the, the, the perfect face, a pre-Raphaelite portrait. It's, ugh. It just sounds awful. It's, a, like, it sounds like something you would write in high school, you know? Like, it's, it's not good. I've heard a lot of praise for it. I'm going to keep going with it. It actually, so the la chapter four was pretty, pretty good. That was the chapter I read this morning. Um, so I'm hopeful that maybe it's going to get a little bit better. Anyway, that's all I'm reading right now. Thank you for listening to this. Hopefully I can cut it down to something that like is watchable in editing. Yeah. Have a good day.